So I realize we are still in you know, phase zero of the human cell atlas, following a, a, a kickoff in, in London last October. We're still in this phase of, of planning out what exactly does the atlas mean, how exactly is it going to be done. We made huge progress in this meeting with the announcement that there would be a, a data coordinating platform. Big thanks to, to CZI and to the, the three groups involved in that. There still is this question of like, where's the data that's going to get coordinated in this platform going to come from? And as some of the questions in the previous session, you know, we're, we're, we're getting at what's the plan for making those data? So that's okay. We're still in phase zero, but we're soon going to, I think, reach the point where there is a clear plan for a phase one atlas. Um, I'm hoping by some time at the end of the year we'll have phase one atlas plan and be able to execute on that. And of course, that's just a draft atlas. A lot's going to get learned from a draft atlas. And then there will, at some point, we'll turn to making a finished human cell atlas, which in the grand tradition of the Human Genome Project will never really be finished. But that doesn't matter. Finished is a, is a term that indicates the vast majority, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, there'll be some finished cell atlas. This session is not about phase zero, and it's not about the phase one draft, and it's not about the phase two finished. This session is about phase three. That's the topic for today. That is, at some point, maybe it's 10 years from now, what's going to have happened because of the human cell atlas? It's a great open-ended topic. It's a chance for us to blue sky, for this panel to blue sky, about what the implications of that will be. And it's important to do it because as you're doing phase zero and phase one and phase two, it's helpful to know where this is going because either in the atlas itself or in many projects ancillary to the atlas but going on in parallel, we're going to have to try things and learn things. So we've put together an amazing panel here from five different countries and many different biological and biomedical perspectives. And my job is, is to start off a conversation amongst them about what will be the implications when we're done with this phase two finished atlas. But then we'll also throw it open to questions from the audience about that. So we have Benny Geiger from the Weizmann. We have Priska Liberali from Basel. We have Emma Lundbury from the KTH here in Stockholm. We have Mario Suva from the MGH in the Broad. And we have Alex van Udenarden from Delft. Five different countries, five different backgrounds, and all they must do in the remaining 40 minutes is completely project where this is all going to go, how it is going to impact basic biology, developmental biology, cell biology, clinical medicine, pharmaceutical development, cancer diagnostics, vaccine development, infectious disease, neurobiology, and whatever else is left out. So, if I can have a handheld microphone, great. Um, Start off. Is this working? Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Oh, and by the way, along the way, as we talk about what the implications are going to be, it's fair game to talk about what we're going to have to solve in order to get to those implications. So let me, let me start off with cell biology. It's a good place to start. What is cell biology going to look like a decade from now, in light of this, the, this human cell atlas. Yes, Emma. I think that cell biology will be uh, always taking a more holistic view of the cells, integrating these network models and metabolic models and, uh, well, the whole uh, unification of different uh, molecules and levels and spatial information and less of these single... Mm, well, I, well, the short answer, more holistic view, I think. What does that mean? I think you will, we will start to see the cell more as the system that it is and how it functions and that one part affects all the other things. The deviation in spatial distribution might affect a lot of things. Uh, one, the change of one molecule can affect a lot of other things. So we will study it more as the entity that it is. So a student in your lab is going to run an experiment. and. They're going to get some data. What are they going to do with those data? They're going to 
you know, look things up? What, what are all the things they can look up for the context that will be available to your student? Just imagine that experience for a student. I, I, I imagine that this UMass Al Atlas, if 10 years from now, that's what we're speaking about, every, a lot of models and the, every data that you will need will be available and you can probably query or upload your uh, images and query it towards all other images or other types of data and it, I think it will be a completely different perspective than So every right experiment now. you do the students going to look up yes. have elements of this pattern be seen been seen in any other experiment that's been run anywhere in the world Yes I think so And and those will be sorted somehow into kind of meaningful categories and dictionary elements and, and all. Yeah. yeah, and hopefully we, ha we have much better visualizations tools also too, because it's a complex visualization problem. Yeah, we don't want to get a long list yeah. out of the computer. <laughs> what do other people think about what, what a student's experience is going to be? Alex and then Benny? I think I want to make the analogy with uh, the Human Genome Project, which you know a lot about. So I think before we knew how the DNA looked like, uh, talking about mutations was almost impossible, right? So you didn't know if you inherited a mutation, what, what that meant, because there was no reference. I think it's the same with uh, the, you know, the, the HCA. So 10 years from now, we have a beautiful reference that we know, you know, lots of cells, what they do and which organs they are. And I think in 20, perhaps 15 years from now, when you go to the hospital, single cell sequencing will be completely standard. You, you know, your blood will be single cell sequenced. And you go to the atlas and you say, well, that looks perfectly referenced. So no, don't worry. But uh, there might be uh, cell types that are very different in, in, in that particular case. And in the reference, they will be absent or they'll be very uh, weird. And you're saying, hey, that's a mutation, I mean, an analogy with uh, the sequence. And then you know, okay, hopefully there will be enough statistics that you can go after that. But I think you know, 20 years from now, that might be uh, the, yeah. the same as we do now with mutations. You say, well, this is a very rare mutation. I never saw that before. Uh, but you need a reference for that. So again, I'm going to hold off on the, exactly the clinical. We'll come back to this clinical, but I get the same spirit. Benny, do you want Well, I, I, I think that uh, for many cell biologists, I think the attraction to science is to try to understand cell behavior, behavior of biological entity, at a mechanistic level. Mm -hmm. So figure out in a, in a very detailed fashion or intuitive manner, understand how cells making decisions um, and understanding the molecular processes that drive it. Some of them are easily seen looking at the genome. Others require a very detailed, a very sophisticated analysis of the genome. And maybe that many of them will require another type of, of information uh, well, if I look a little bit into the systems biology type of approach, uh, you can get a lot of information by multiple perturbation and analysis of responses and, and get from that tremendous amount of information. And I think I mean, listening to, to the discussion that uh, were carried out here, which were predominantly a bit for me, a bit out of my daily, daily work, uh, but uh, what seemed to me that many of the issues that uh, were discussed here and are solved at the computational level uh, could be exposed to, uh, to multiple perturbation experiments at a variety of complexity levels in mm -hmm. systems that are much more defined, less physiological and more defined, uh, have little noise and, and, higher speci and high specificity, and compare them and run them in parallel to, to analysis that are being made at the level of whole organism, a human, mouse, and so on, or other simpler model organisms, and so on. I think, I think running it in parallel is pretty important. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I mean, there were topics that were described and discussed here, which, in which some of the experiments with the, the, the more sort of dirty experiments uh, and and, and uh, experiment experiment intensive exper uh, approaches were sort of referred to as a next stage, as something that could be done later. My my feeling is that it's quite critical that it will happen and and occur in parallel mm -hmm. and not later, so that the sets of standards will be determined together by the two populations and mechanisms will be part of the target 
and essays for studying and verifying mechanism, uh, mechanisms, I mean, will be, will be developing all along between the two communities. Now, part of it can be provided, but what people call synthetic biology, in which you try to create biologically relevant systems uh, that are good, that are predictive in, 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 in many ways. Um, other can, by the way, rely also on other activities that occur outside the human cell atlas activity. I mean, for example, there are in Europe, uh, there are several uh, systems that are dealing extensively with imaging, image standardization. Uh, there's a computation system, which is Multimod, which I think is working exactly on the same issues mm -hmm. of defining vocabularies, defining annotations, and so on and so forth for analysis of cell state and cell activity, and by neurobioimaging and a few others that could fit in quite well. Great. Yeah. So, Priska, let's get you in this conversation. Yes. Where do you see this going? So, I think that for cell biologists, the, we, we all look at mechanism, but I think in the past years, we were still trying to have an average mechanism of an average single cell. And I think in the next 10 years, and with the help of the Atlas, then where we could really fit our mechanism in the different single cells and really try to see how this average mechanism is probably... So, so when you say mechanism, there are many possible meanings. It could be the gene regulatory mechanism. Yes. Um, so let's, let's just take that. Or the signaling pathway. Or signaling so, pathway. Or That's probably gene compliment. regulatory. Are we going to understand the gene regulatory events that lead to any particular fate? Yes. And will we be able to predict? I mean, right now, people reprogram cells from one state to some other state by making magic mixtures and doing things, and they have no idea why that's happening. Yes, and I think combining the single cell with a broad population of cells and having both the single cell approach, having not, not trying to merge them on in, into an average cell, but really look at the individuality and how they interact in a population can really bring us an understanding how, in a way, a population of cells differentiate and renew. It's not so the you single... said two interesting things there. There's, there's sort of population implying that there's an inherent stochasticity, that the stochastic nature is not a bug, it's a feature of this whole thing. And, and that, that's, a really, that's a really interesting aspect alone. Yes, and I think that stochasticity is an aspect that emerges from population of cells. Some of the aspects of this stochastic emergence in a population can be determined by clear cell biological features like asynchrony in cell cycle stages or depending on how the receptor of some signaling pathways express depending how the cells migrate, and some are just really of random probabilistic nature. So combining our understanding of the cell biology of these probabilistic events and the full uh, randomness and how this emerges in a population and how this can be used to really drive development. And, and, and you mentioned communication, yes. which could be a very important aspect of a population also. That is essential and is how single cell feel the population, how at the single cell level a population can be felt. So, so this, how a single cell can feel how many cells are so, around. So while the atlas itself is not going to do the biology of communication and, and all this interaction, it sounds like it'll be a foundation for an awful lot of investigation now of how the society of cells works together. Yes, and also how different concepts we have in different tissues can be also really in parallel looked at in different similar tissue. We'll have multiple epithelial tissue in our body and see how different type of patterns arise in all the different ones and how we can really combine data for all different type of organ. So let me switch gears for a second and let's swing all the way over to the clinical. Let's not worry about getting stuff approved by the FDA and all that, <laughs> because, because that's complicated. No, I, I say that with a norm. In fact, I've just come back from you know, the day before yesterday, uh, visiting at the FDA and speaking with the agency and the commissioner, and, and, and they're really getting very excited about this cell atlas stuff. But I respect the fact that to roll something out into the clinic takes a lot of validation. So within my 10-year window, maybe not all of that will be completed, but let's talk about at least what will be clear that will be doable? So leaving aside the validation, 
how will the clinic look different? What, what will happen? Already you've made some, some suggestions, but let me start with Mario, if I might. Um, tell me about the clinic. Sure. Um, so as a, as a background, maybe for the, for the audience, I'm a, I'm a pathologist. So I'm actually coming from the medical end to this community. And I, I think if we see what pathology has learned over the last decade with the Genome Project and, and sequencing the DNA of, of disease state, we haven't really reached a state in which um, every single patient that comes to the clinic is fully sequenced. But what we have now is much better categorization of disease, much better understanding of biology of disease, and we have targeted tests for informative information um, that has come out from all these uh, large-scale efforts. And I think, you know, if, if you think of, of um, single-cell analysis, there's, not a, there, there's almost no disease in humans that is not associated with a change in morphology of the tissue, in cell composition, in cell-cell uh, interaction, uh, in, in architecture disruption. And I think by systematically studying both normal and disease state, we will understand a whole lot of biology right, and a so whole lot of disease. Let's just focus on this one bit. You're a pathologist. What is a pathologist going to be doing 10 years from now after a human cell atlas? I think they're going to be doing pretty much what they're doing now after the Genome Atlas um, project, which is doing pathology plus a whole lot of new tests that will be targeted, that will have come out from new biology and new understanding from the human cell atlas. So I don't think necessarily every patient will have the tissue single cell sequenced, but there will be a whole lot of more understanding of what, um, you know, markers for disease and, and markers for categorization of disease uh, that will come out from this effort. And mm -hmm. it will lead to better disease understanding and better management. So for the patients that do have their tissues, say, in situ sequenced or molecular ion beam imaged or something like that, will there be worldwide databases where I can look up that image and say this is most similar to uh, the following category of things that led to the following category of outcomes? I think that would be one model. I think okay, that's, that's so one model. That's where you can blast your uh, results. You blast and you the blast image and, and against you find, everything. Yeah, yeah, I think that's one model. Uh, the other model being, again, better textbook knowledge of disease, and you just run that test, and you understand already just by that will, test. Will there still be textbooks? Yeah, anyway, carry on. There will carry always on. be textbooks. Like, <laughs> throughout time, people have tried to erase textbooks and, and yeah, 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 technology, I'm but carry on. they come yeah. back all the time. Cool. Benny? Can I just add a comment of, from somebody who worked a lot with pathologists over the years? Uh -huh. And I think I, I was always advised, and I think I, I, it was right, to go to what is defined as an experienced pathologist. Mm -hmm. now, it's, 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 what is experienced pathologist? I mean, somebody who makes relatively little mistakes and, and can, can, do to, can, can do proper diagnosis. And it's very often, I was told, takes many years for a pathologist to acquire this information. So which means that if I look at a tissue and some and, and an experienced pathologist looks at a tissue, we, see, we may see very different things. And in order to reach any kind of uh, precision phenotyping uh, of, let's say, histopathology, uh, to doing precision pathology, I think the tools that are needed are still are yet not there. And I think this is this is something which is definitely, I think, one of the aims. So, of, what, what kind of tools do you want? Well, I think first, first, I think uh, there can be a development in tissue preparation. I think I think that's that's already was estimated. If you want to get information, you should try to standardize. Uh, th this process. I think uh, the, the three-dimensional reconstruction and image analysis should be much improved. I mean, the idea of working in multicolor, but really multicolor, uh, multi-multicolor multi uh, definition of different different cell types yeah. in, 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 in a section. 
is something which, which may add information. And then you, to this, you add all the genetic information that you are acquiring, or metabolomic information, or proteomic information, and what have you. Look for the correlation, look for the relationships. And I think this will provide you a very, very strong possibility to look at the slide uh, in, in future years and then reach a diagnosis or reach treatment. So let me make sure I understand this multi, multi, multi color. There's an awful lot of, of pathology, uh, forgive me, that has the character of, you know, you look at this marker of something. But it, it sounds like you're saying that the idea of the, the single marker of something is going to melt away in favor of a signature. And that out of this human cell atlas, may come a signature that says the following 14 and a half genes being up and these three being down is a not only good but almost unique indicator of this state. And I could even make a very cheap and inexpensive, very, very inexpensive, very accurate way of recognizing that signature. Because one of the issues we had with, with the Genome Project in the early days is you might look at a little bit of sequence, but, but you, you had no idea of whether that was a unique descriptor of the thing you were talking about. But if you have unique descriptors of states, that suddenly gets, you know, pretty powerful. So Emma, you were gonna jump in and say something there. Yes, I was thinking of the textbooks. I'm getting back to the big picture here. Uh, I think that the cell atlas in 10 years, it will definitely help to drive the transition from population medicine to personalized precision medicine. But with that comes also the need of personalized communication of this Ooh. very complex data to the yeah, that's been really easy in the human genome stuff, yeah. <laughs> so, so I think that textbooks are good, but I think that we will need to push the development of other forms of communication to actually get the patients to understand their personalized uh, signature and their information and motivate them to make the lifestyle changes or take the treatment that they need. So, so what are you thinking? I think that's a big challenge what, what, also. What sort of innovations might help us with that? Well, I, I'm a, a <laughs> big fan of gaming as a means of communication. Gaming? Yes. That's mm. a personalized. There, I think there's a lot of ways that you can educate and teach people and learn them things. Maybe reach out to uh, socioeconomic groups that you wouldn't reach out to otherwise, for example. Um, you could even teach, like, teach histology through a, I don't know, virtual reality. I mean, there's a lot uh, developing in the visualization area, and I think we can make use of that and integrate those disciplines. Well, it's probably not too early to start those gaming companies now. That's good. I like Oh, that. life science gaming. Life science gaming. Oh, this is interesting. Psylife, the game. All right. So, um, now I, I, I'll come back to first world medicine in a second, but, but, but can I just, because you, you made me think about, you know, all these people who don't necessarily understand this. I want to turn to the developing world for a moment. What will be the impact of HCA on medicine in the developing world? Don't all jump up at once here. <laughs> but you know, if we're going to really justify projects like this, it can't just be benefit to the most developed countries. It's a tough one, but I think what is really powerful about a technology is that it's very relatively simple right? if you would at least uh, the sequencing of, of cells i think in a few years you can take a chip anywhere you want in the world you know collect the materials put them in the wells and actually with relative low tech can get this into um, high quality libraries right? which is a slightly different from like very high tech microscopy for example i've been working in microscopy for a long time and there you develop a lot of technology and it's very local and you know you need the right people but i think for the sequencing part the single cell sequencing this i think will get really you know you need a pcr machine a way to kind of disperse the cells so you can go to any any country in, in the third world and for example uh take samples and look at you know infectious diseases for example look at um yeah, do this at a local uh, locally i think that's really important so at, at least the technology i think is well suited for disseminating across the world and you're not completely limited to very you know big centers which have the, the you know the capacity and the money to run these big machines right? so mm -hmm. i think this this is this is very promising so you know what kind of applications i don't know but i think the technology is at least um you, you can you know spread it around the world so i think you, maybe you made this mention i know aviv did in her talk about just a complete blood count 
much can we learn, do we think, from, from a CBC, patient walks in anywhere in the world, and we want to know what's going on with that patient. They, they're febrile, but we don't have a better description than that. How good a job will we do from a CBC that consists of reading the expression pattern um, of 20,000 cells? That's definitely where I would start, is with the blood, because that's the easiest you know, kind of cells that you can get. Um, it's hard to say what you will learn, but if you just extrapolate from you know, what I, other systems that we looked at and, and, and the additional information that we got by looking at the single cell, I think there's going to be a huge amount of extra information in there. You know, a lot of these traditional classifiers for lymphocytes or erythroblast, they're very approximate. They're pretty good, but uh, if you look at a lot of the, the work now, if you take one of those purified populations by antibodies, they consist of 10 other populations that are very clearly... Yeah. And, if you start to get more and more data, you will see correlations between these 10 new populations and the phenotype of the patients, right? So it's, I think you'll get, you know, just zoom in an extra tenfold and you, you will so probably why get... know, when the patient comes in, why know whether they have a bacterial or a viral infection? Right now, you bring the kid in with the ear infection and the doctor gives you antibiotics for the kid because the doctor wants to give you something but has no idea whether this is bacterial or viral in origin. And it's one of the many, many reasons of how we abuse antibiotics. Will that be a thing of the past? Will we just be able to know whether this was viral or a bacterial agent based on, on reading out of CBC? Mario, do you think that'll be a... Um, again, I think that's uh, one of the possible futures. I think um, we, um, we, you know, there are other ways to read out if it's bacterial or viral that not necessarily require a single cell analysis. But I think, uh, the, um, again, like we will, I have no doubt that, you know, the technology is completely agnostic of the underlying disease. And, and uh, you know, when we're talking about the developing world, I think uh, it's, it's mostly a, a different type of disease that we see there, but there can be solved by single cell analysis just in the same way as disease in, in you know, more developed areas can be solved. And, and I think that's the beauty of the technology. It's completely agnostic of disease, and it, it can solve a whole different types of disease. And I think uh, if we apply these techniques to, to diseases that affect the developing world, there again we will learn a lot about the biology of this underlying disease, and we will have better, maybe also targeted tests. I keep going back to the targeted tests because I, I'm also realistic in terms of you know, cost and what can be implemented mm -hmm. in the clinic. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's no doubt that new targeted tests emerge from these large-scale efforts, and they are useful on a daily clinical basis throughout the world. Cool. Benny? So ju ju just to, to, to add two little points. Uh, I think that, uh, that uh, when it comes to, to the question of what would be, what would be the effect on, on disease, first we should remember the dynamic nature of disease. So in a way, uh, at, at a given time point, single time point, you may get very limited information compared to what you may get looking at exactly the same indicators at different time points and, and figuring out the kinetics or the dynamics processes of the disease itself. The other uh, point is that I believe it's difficult to figure out exactly how far you can go with genomic data only. And the question is, uh, in the pursuit for different sources of information, uh, every detail that you can collect, which is easily achievable, you can, you can look at it through the microscope, you can look at cell counts, define different cell types, all this type of information, in addition to the genetic background, is, can be very critical, can make things much simpler and much faster in terms of getting a definitive and, and, and accurate definition and prediction of the behavior of the disease. So that's, that should be appreciated along the way of exploring things. We can identify where the difficulties in relying on genomic information, where the problems appear, and try to look for complementary approaches, and they are there. Mm -hmm. they, are, they, are, they are there, they are relevant. What about cancer? How will the treatment of cancer be different For sure, I think that part of one, one important part is that the differentiation we see in the cells. 
Yeah. So that, and this, we could really have an atlas where we can map these cells and seeing how far they go. And so this would for sure give us an understand, a better understanding of what uh, ha hap is happening. And I think the cancer is not very different compared to other disease in, in a way that it would get more personalized and more precise and, uh, uh, I, I think it might also get earlier detection with these very sensitive methods. Mm -hmm. I think it's an opportunity to, to you know, we, we run a lot of, of uh, cytology tests, for example, to do early detection of disease. Um, these are based on, you know, uh, visual assessment of, of altered state. And I think if we can implement some of the single cell sequencing technologies to those kind of application, it certainly will improve the uh, accuracy of the early detection steps, and that also might lead to you know better so, management. So early de detection is also just plain old response. If you talk about whether a patient shows a partial response or a complete response by radiographic resist criteria, but of course you might see a, a complete response. Sorry, two minutes for what? <laughs> I thought we're supposed to go to twelve thirty according to this. But. Oh, okay. Well, we're almost done then. Um, <laughs> my official instructions had us going to 12.30, but we're good. So, you know, being able to tell which classes of tumor cells were responding to the drug versus others. Maybe you're wiping out 98%, but having no effect whatsoever on the 2%, that's not going to do much for you. Absolutely. I think that's a clear uh, application for single cell analysis in a situation of, of matched pre and post treatment, especially in partial response and in recurrence settings. We will understand not only, you know, the, the kind of the leftover, maybe genetic clones that have not responded, but also the phenotypes of the cells that have not responded and how the microenvironment has adapted to the tr treatment. So absolutely, I think that the, uh, the residual disease or recurrent disease settings is a very good application for single cell analysis, especially in cancer. So I know we have to wrap up here in just a moment, but Emma, if you were giving advice to a starting graduate student today, planning her career going forward, what kind of advice would you give about what they should learn and know to be a productive and happy scientist over the course of their career starting today, given what's going on? Of, uh, well, I would say that computational uh, expertise is something... Well, it's that popular with the audience yes, here, It's I'm very sure. popular here. <laughs> <laughs> and also the ability to work with different types of data, so, uh, and across scales. I think that's a, a kind of multi-scale unification challenge will be big in the future. Yeah, it'll be a good time for students coming into the field. It's just going to be very exciting. So look, my plan was then to turn to the audience for about 15 minutes of questions, but, but I'm informed that those 15 minutes are no longer available per Dana here. And so um, in that case, um, I want to thank the panel for letting us uh, hear the range of ideas about where it's all going. It's pretty exciting. Thank you, panel.